From about the age of 18 till maybe 25, I worked as a waiter in about 13 different restaurants, I think. And I would bounce around a lot due to being really reactive and triggered, and I tended to think that the grass was always greener somewhere else. And I did that work from graduating high school till about a year or two after graduating college until I really just couldn't do it anymore. And by the end, restaurants weren't good for me and I wasn't good for restaurants, which is kind of a life lesson. I think my trauma kept me in that industry too long for fear of failing at something new or not being able to make it in something healthier. And that's something I see with my own clients, despite what kind of job they have, restaurants or not. And I eventually got emotionally healthy and confident enough to take a risk and leave for something more professional with regular hours and better quality of life for me. But I didn't grow up in a family system that helped you take healthy risk or taught you to value or believe in yourself. So going after something better was really foreign and sort of quite terrifying for me. And despite all that, I think that everyone should actually spend a year or uh, at least a year working in restaurants to learn about yourself, to learn about humanity, and to become more in tune with how the world works and to make something happen for better or worse with all different types of people. I was able to pay my rent and pay through undergrad and it gave me some income and flexibility to do all that working in restaurants. I learned how to swear in Portuguese and I can swear in Haitian Creole. I learned to appreciate someone else's hard work. And I also know that no matter what country you're from, humans are the same in the way that we all need to make a buck to survive and build some kind of life for ourselves. Also, I'm eternally grateful for that period in my life actually in that work where there were people that I worked with in restaurants that I still miss and love and you know what got me to therapy and recovery and where I am today was actually a fellow server, um, a really good friend could see how traumatized I was and he just you know gave me the number of his therapist and that was the end of it. you know that's what got me here. Um, but after about seven years of that type of work, you really start to rethink your life every time you pick up a plate and your thumb lands in someone else's food. So anyway, about work triggers, which is what this video is about, um, all restaurants have this thing that wait staff need to do called side work. And I don't know why I'm putting it in quotes, but <laughs> it means that um, you have to get that restaurant ready for business or set up for the following day. It means that you get in an hour or so before your shift and you essentially do unpaid work. Or at least that's how I saw it. You know, wait staff have historically made about $2.50 here in the US, and the rest of your income comes from tips. So the restaurant's argument is that the weights, it's the wait staff's responsibility to set up the place unpaid because they reaped the most benefit from the sales and the commission of the food, wine, and all that kind of stuff, where other people in the restaurant were hourly employees. And that $2.50 per hour covered things like social security and taxes here in the US. Um, it's been years, and I, I know I'm giving an overly simplified version of this, but that's kind of low down as it was when I worked as a waiter in the 90s. So side work can range from making stupid lobster boats, <laughs> which is like a bib with a lobster on it, um, and metal crackers to crack open the shells and a paper bucket to put the, the shells in and to rolling silverware, polishing wine glasses, marrying ketchup. Google marrying ketchups if you, ketchup if you want to be grossed out. <laughs> There's also polishing silverware, making butter ramekins if you, working, if you were working a breakfast shift. There's a special hell on earth if you're a breakfast server in a breakfast restaurant. Um, Here's the trigger about side work. Coming back to the hourly wage, you could show up before opening your shift to do all that side work, get ready, have a pre-shift meal or whatever, and be cut and sent home if you wanted to if there wasn't any real business that night. So all that might be you know, different if you were making a, uh, or a, even a minimum hourly wage. Um, it would, it would at least be not so demoralizing because you just wasted about four to five hours of your day getting there and back and doing all that. Though in reality, you know, sometimes you'd make great money, um, but the work was incredibly hard for it on a busy night with high sales. But the restaurant usually saw it as it was money that you like fell into or that they provided that opportunity for you rather than you working very hard for it. That was the kicker or the nature of these triggers. So the vibe in the restaurant was that servers have the easiest job and made the most money. 
And anyone that's ever done it, I'm sure would argue quite you know, strongly on that. So there was always this intense animosity between the front of the house, which was like servers, and the back of the house, which was sort of cooking and prepping and managing all that stuff. It, you know, it was rare to work in a place that you didn't have that toxic dynamic going on. And it's a lot like the toxic family roles or sibling rivalry, and I'm getting more to that. So anyway, like with most servers, I hated side work. Not so much for doing it, but what was implied behind it. Like the labor message behind it felt like, you should be grateful to do all this extra work because we you have to value the restaurant because the restaurant does so much for you for your meager life. Does that sound anything like your family? Um, that you're beholden to them for your very existence. So I know I'm going out on a limb with here, but stay with me. So um, that should be that you should be perpetually grateful for your income or that if you're frustrated with unpaid work, you have a horrible attitude. All that stuff. You know, restaurant management loves to shame servers much like a toxic parent does. That was my experience. I know that sounds weird, but restaurant managers were sort of like my nemesis <laughs> in those years. So to explore this trigger around side work, I grew up in a highly abusive family that gave me a complex around fairness in the idea of give and take. Um, I don't think I've met a, a childhood trauma survivor yet that didn't have issues around fairness, probably for good reason. But in a funny way, um, one of my mentors sort of said, like, he, he, uh, I'll never forget it when he said, like, I have a highly overdeveloped sense of fairness and I knew exactly what he meant. So um, in my family, my father, who had narcissistic personality disorder in addition to alcoholism, always made you jump through hoops if you needed something that was like a basic parenting kid thing. Like if I needed a permission slip signed or some money for a field trip or lunch money, there was always this manipulation around it. Like, well, go do the dishes, clean the kitchen, take out the trash and I'll think about it. And I'm like eight. It wasn't the parenting around healthy chores or contributing to the household. It was something for something when it came to my dad. And he, he'd use basic needs as leverage to manipulate. I wonder if that sounds familiar. Um, he saw the needs of his children and others as an opportunity for himself, kind of like side work in my mind. The restaurant benefits from all that free labor um, and all the places that I worked in created this shameful narrative about it that would trigger me. So later in life, whether it was jobs, college, a bureaucracy like the cable company, or an insurance company, making me jump through hoops used to be a major trigger for me that would get me enraged. And I'd have an over-the-top reaction to such things, not knowing it was coming from how I grew up. And this, this stage of my life, I'm so much more chill. Things roll off my back. You know, if, if, if I have to get on the phone with a cable company, I see them as more human and I don't feel persecuted by all that. But that wasn't always the case. So where am I going with all this? Well, I spent most of my time in restaurants triggered to feeling like I was being taken advantage of or being made to jump through hoops, real or imagined. My work environments would take me right back to my family system in my childhood trauma in some way. And it created a lot of unnecessary suffering about just normal kind of work. You know, this is what I would bring into these places. A job is just a job. And way more well-adjusted coworkers than me saw jobs simply for what they were, but I projected a lot of my family system onto the, onto the places of employment that I was in. I made things into moral issues all the time because I was trying to solve and process the moral dysfunction and the unfairness in my own childhood. I think many of us do that in our work, in our romantic relationships unconsciously. Um, I was the common denominator in all that. I mean, um, trauma survivors like me and my clients often find themselves stuck battling a job in some way, um, much like they battled their family in some way. So as a reminder, I'm not saying it's one thing over the other. I was triggered by side work to my family system, but no shocker here, the service industry typically does take advantage of its employees. Both things are true, but our, child, our childhood trauma stuff and triggers is what's going on with it or what we can really control and work on it. So the funny thing is because of all that, I wasn't a very good employee. Um, in fact, I was a crappy one, despite um, the one-sided employment stuff that I, that I would find myself in. Um, I was always baffled by folks who kept their head down and did their job and left it at that. That was way more healthier than what I brought in. 
So I found that working on myself makes me, working for myself makes me much happier where I'm not in a system that doesn't do right by people, whether it's me or the clients or whatever. I'm not good in those places. And I'd like you to think about what makes you not good in a job. What is it about a job that puts you at your worst? Is it swimming against the tide of battling a dysfunctional place? Is it trying to get validation from a very cold and humane system? Think about what it means for you. Um, and think about you in that system and why it triggers you. This video will help with that. As a side note, the biggest lesson that I've learned is that no matter what I do inside emotionally, that won't make the place less abusive or wrong for me. A lot of us have magical thinking that if we change our internal system totally, then we can tolerate a place or be happy at a place. That's not always true. I've tried to do that many times. So. If you're new to me or new to the channel, welcome. If you like this video, feel free to hit some buttons on the screen. You really can't miss with any of the buttons. And if you feel like these videos are helpful to you in your recovery, you can consider supporting the work that goes into this channel over at my Patreon. I do not take on any third-party paid sponsorships in this channel because I feel like it mucks things up for the viewer. In addition, you can go to my website to do some childhood trauma e-course work that I offer there, including a webinar recording of a shame webinar that I did that discussed shame triggers through doing an inner child exercise called dialoguing. From the release of this video through January 1st, 2022, you can get an additional 20% off all my courses by using the code HEAL when prompted to complete the purchases. Um, you can also get in touch with me through my website. You can also connect with me to my Instagram or my TikTok, and I will have all the links in the description of this video below. So here is a list of five highly common triggers that come up for childhood trauma survivors around work. And if you wanna grab some paper for notes, I'll be giving some reflective journaling prompts about dealing with these triggers after we go through this list. Try to think about these over the course of your entire working life, not just what you have going on currently. And this video is more about childhood trauma than actual work advice. So the first issue is, let's just get this big one out of the way is, Issues with our boss authority. Most of my clients talk about this incredibly hard dynamic, which is the relationship to our boss, which is usually very complicated for childhood trauma survivors. And here are some common dynamics or types of situations that I see in my practice and from my own experience that come with this relationship. For each of these five triggers, I'm gonna be going through over what they look like, what it feels like to be triggered around them, and then how they might originate from childhood trauma. So the issues with this one can look like the boss that dangles carrots on the stick and manipulates you, like in my example, sort of with my father, um, the boss that you're too intimate with, that you disclose too much to. You might have even have had a romantic relationship with at some point. There's some blurred lines going on. If the relationship has poor boundaries in these ways, it's odd to receive supervisory energy from a person like this. And this is rooted in codependency, that one. The boss who treats you like they are doing you a favor for being employed there. The boss that you get into it with, like you bring conflict into that relationship. The boss who is normal and decent, but you're terrified of them or you have this negative feeling or shame-based feelings around them, but you don't really know why the boss that pretends to nurture you but is really just in it for their own sort of benefit or their own career. I see that a lot with my clients. The fake boss, like they're faking leadership in a deluded way, also that they're inco incompetent. The reactive and moody and angry boss. The crazy making boss from gaslighting to fickleness to being disorganized. The boss that says issues aren't really issues, like the minimizer. And the boss that doesn't hold other employees accountable. That's its own category that we're gonna to come to later. Here are some signs that, um, that you are triggered by this relationship. And I'm, I'm not saying that these are right or wrong, I'm just saying that they just are. Um, this person takes up way too much space in your head. You're overly reactive around them or when you're communicating with them, even over email, you might want a level of specialness from them that never comes. You are really triggered about how that person runs the place, that you're really reactive about their decisions or their choices. You might somewhat rebel or even act out around this person unconsciously. You spend a lot of time either navigating them or trying to impress them or find yourself really feeling let down by them. 
and we tend to ruminate about this person in our lives. Um, here are some ideas about where these triggers come from in childhood, and this is broad. So you'll most likely struggle with triggers around authority like this if you grew up in any of the following. In emotional neglect, where the ways you tried to get attention or be worthy or be acceptable, rooted in your shame and rooted in your survival. Um, if you grew up in conditional love or if you were parentified. If you grew up in shame-based families. If you grew up where um, parents were submissive to authority or even rebellious or antagonistic against it too much. If simply you tried and tried and tried to matter to your parents, but that never worked. If you were in this competitive or unbalanced relationships between you and your siblings. And if you grew up with you know, like uh, perpetrators or highly toxic parents where you're oddly drawn to or, or there's something really familiar to you about manipulative people. Um, if you grew up with parents who had some substance abuse going on or struggled with mental illness, um, or if you were overly sided with one parent over the other where there was loyalty issues going on, or you might have really rooted for the tragic parent, or perhaps maybe even you may be rooted for a dysfunctional boss in that way. You're like, that's codependency. There are many other issues that come with this issue, and this issue of authority is huge. Um, why I think it's such a consistent big issue for childhood trauma survivors is growing up, the abuse was often about the misuse of power in the authority um, and being seen by those who had that power and who had that authority. The goal is to have our boss relationships to be right-sized, meaning smaller in our mind and not so big to our inner child. They're just passing people in your life. You know, think about all the bosses that you've had and how much space they took up in your head, and they're now gone from your life. They were just sort of, sort of just coming and going. Um, it's, re it's actually a side note. It's really a rare gift to have a good working relationship with a boss that is rooted, rooted in like mutual respect. Like that is rare. It's a gift when we sort of have that. Up next is not being seen. What I mean by this one is really being activated when you're not valued and treated like just another cog in the wheel of the workplace, which takes us right back to our family systems. The feelings on this one can range from any, from range from rage to like hopelessness. And the issues can look like any of the following. Others getting credit for your work. Being passed up for raises or not getting recognition. The boss never really learns about you, like your name and stuff. It can look like being thrown to the wolves, not getting any mentorship, being made to do the work of two or three people with all this gross, robotic, corporate speak, like you're gonna pick up all of Tim's projects going forwards and we'll put on paper that Mike's gonna assist you, but he really can't because he's overloaded too. Um, it can look like your boundaries are crossed around your schedule or your time or your availability. Um, you raise valid concerns that consistently get dismissed, like, hey, we'll lose that client, and they're like, it's fine. And this is a big one, like, like you said, let's say you do a huge chunk of work or contribute to the place in some way, and it goes totally unnoticed, or people are like, big whoop. Another is um, that, that they never remember that you, you provided a resource for them, and they, that you did that two years ago, and every meeting they're like, oh, Patrick, it'd be great if you created this list and had all that information available to me, even though that you already did that, and I'm not gonna go check it out every time you tell me you already did that. <laughs> um, or like, you know, that people don't use work you know, in the way that, in the way that you like, or don't use your services in a way that you're there for anyway. Um, another big one is not being valued because you don't subscribe to the work culture. A trigger for me used to be like this feeling like I was the weirdo because I didn't want to go down to tchotchkes after work with the gang and talk about sports or whatever. I'm not saying that work culture is inherently bad, but it's just like being an odd duck in a conforming family if you don't live a lifestyle like that or if you don't really want to go do all that. Like, this is a trigger around intimacy, autonomy, and acceptance of differences, which is huge in the dysfunctional family system. Um, another is issues where there's like literally sexual harassment or highly inappropriate things going on and HR is all corporate about it and they're like, well, sounds hard. You should work, figure out a way to work together. Another issue is that as trauma survivors, our expectations are too off and we usually put all of our self-worth and our stock into being seen at a place and in a way like we're we're looking for our we're looking for our worth through the place and when we don't get it that can be a trigger and we have to really look at that 
Um, and this one could be its own category, but it's what I would call corporate speak. Like when you're working for a place and they say stuff like, going forward, or um, please advise, or let's re-energize your team, or that's outside of our paradigm. And all that gross, inauthentic BS that goes on can take us right back to our family system, whether it's a corporate job or even a chain coffee store that can really, their language can really grate on you because um, it does take us back to our family system. Here are some signs that you're triggered about not being seen at work. And again, I'm not saying that these are right or wrong. I'm just saying they kind of just are. Um, you might be caught in a mode of that you keep trying to be valuable at work and it gets you kind of nowhere. You might put a lot of energy into making the place better or having better systems. I'm not saying that that's bad or wrong. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a sign. Um, you might have some significant daily resentments going on. You might notice that you put way too much stock into being seen at work, like I mentioned earlier. Um, you might get extremely triggered or jealous of the work favorites or the closer relationships. You might really struggle with not being able to set professional boundaries or speaking up about what you really need. Um, and here is where this trigger might come from in childhood. All of these come from a variety of different reasons, and here are some potential childhood trauma sources of that. So not being seen or valued growing up, big one. It's a direct correlation here by being the invisible child, the neglected child, having preoccupied and unengaged parents, absent parents, or consistently being forgotten about. Another is growing up in a family system that is marinated in passive aggression BS, like coming back to that corporate speak. I think that that's why we might hate it so much because the language is manipulative. What is said on paper on top is a, a disguise of what the real issue or the real thing going on underneath it. That's called metacommunication. Um, not growing up in a family system that cultivates a sense, a healthy sense of self or a healthy identity. Too many trauma survivors think they are they, that they are their work uh, over who they are as a person. Could, could also come from growing up in abuse where achieving and getting A's was a way to be seen. This is a, a survival coping strategy, and it's like our inner child assumes that being a rock star at work is the only way to get love or to be tolerable. Um, it could be growing up in chaos, or parents who struggle with substance abuse or struggle with mental illness. It could be growing up in a system that never heard us or valued who we are or what, how we think. Um, many of us have issues around that. Situations in childhood where um, you raise concerns or you felt them and your parents totally ignored them and did the, did the wrong thing anyway. In this trigger, our inner child is really preoccupied if we matter. And we can get massively triggered when a work situation or environment feels like it's erasing us. And we again have to do, do more extra just to be heard or just to be seen or tolerated. It's perfectly human to want to be valued or at least respected for the work that we do. The work is about your triggers that we can shift by getting our inner adult in place and be more grounded and have, a, have like a healthy plan of action around these triggers. And however, I'm not saying that it's all just you or that it's all just in your head. Um, you could work in an incredibly dismissive job, but it's our triggers and our trauma that keeps us mucking around in such jobs like these. So the next one is really near and dear to my own work experience. This is number three, which is no accountability. No accountability is the work dynamic where toxic, incompetent, manipulative, predatory, or just generally awful coworkers are not held accountable for their actions. Here is what it looks like. Having to clean up or redo someone else's work and they're never reprimanded. Extremely toxic or manipulative people have leverage over your boss or the, or the place and they're never reprimanded or removed. It's almost like blackmail. Um, the toxic or abusive coworker is the only one who knows how to do something in the place or, and that therefore they're too valuable to be held accountable. Um, at one point in my career, I work inpatient acute psychiatry uh, and I was passively sexually harassed by a female psychiatrist who had a reputation for perhaps being the most toxic and difficult person in the hospital. But she was too valued in her specialty and probably too vindictive to be let go of or rep reprimanded in any way, which meant everyone else just had, had to accept working with her and what comes with working with her. 
Um, so there's that. Another is being sexually harassed, stalked, or consistently commented on without any accountability by the people doing it. Another is being asked to do special accommodations for highly dysfunctional coworkers because your boss or management is codependent with that coworker and they feel bad for the tragic or dysfunctional coworker, but you're gonna clean it up somehow. Um, and I'm not saying that uh, it's the empathy is off in it. Um, so, um, empathy is, is always good, but it's like, it's a little, it's something really off about it that doesn't really land right. And that the coworker is most likely manipulating the boss. Another is experiencing hypocritical standards. Like you get written up for not punching in, and while the toxic coworker who is abusive and is embezzling and stealing, they get off totally fine and whatever, that kind of a thing. Here are some signs that you're triggered by no accountability at work. I'm not saying that these are right or wrong, I'm just saying that they just are. Um, getting extremely activated around fairness. Giving up on or losing more and more of your work ethic due to how the situation is or how you're being treated. Becoming consumed with or looking to catch the ways that the toxic person or people are getting away with things. Um, being unable to turn off your upset energy. Considering ways to find justice like going to the media or doing something akin to whistleblowing. Again, I'm not saying these are right or wrong, I'm just saying they just are. I'm just listing the places that have been cues to me that I was overcome with triggers and lost my ability to shift, move on, let go of, or come up with a healthier plan like leaving or taking some kind of action. So where this trigger comes from in childhood, and well, where doesn't this trigger come from in childhood? But here are some possibilities. Abuse from a sibling that has never noticed, addressed, validated, or any actions taken on it. Um, golden child versus scapegoat family dynamics, favoritism among, among siblings. Having an unprotective parent or parents who never saw that you were being abused or showed signs of being abused. Parents who often sided with the wrong person like blame you for being bullied or ask what you did to be bullied in the first place. Another is being like parents who are checked out, neglectful or indifferent. Another is growing up in family systems without any justice and that you were never believed for what was going on. Um, having parents who themselves submitted to abusive, um, di very difficult people. Having parents who made excuses or protected the most abusive person um, in the family and was fine with neglecting others. I think our inner child is too familiar with both the abuse of power and the refusal to use power in a good way and act upon accountability in the workplace. Our inner child had their heart broken too much about there being no justice or at least acknowledgement of abuse and work environments like this can really do a number on us because it's really very, very familiar. Um, if you're in this, try to be brave and try to find a way out. You'd be surprised what happens when you try to go for something better. So moving on, up next is number four. Big one here is performance reviews. Um, this one cuts deep as I have, <laughs> I have a hard time thinking about a more idiotic, inhumane, avoidant, and damaging workplace tool than the idea of a performance review. And I know you're probably saying, well, geez, Patrick, like, how do you really feel about them? <laughs> like, let it all out, buddy. Um, in traditional performance reviews, you're rated usually as an employee on a scale of like one to five or one to seven, with the higher number being more satisfactory of the employee's performance and there are strengths and weaknesses listed, goals for the upcoming year and my biggest issue with this is weirdly asking the employee how they see themselves on that scale to see if it matches up. Both parties sign off on it like a document to have something on paper and maybe you know the company will use that to their advantage later, all that junk. And um, they can also impact raises or promotions, which is problematic given the subjectivity of these things and the dysfunction of these things. And it usually feels like a report card, like you often have to wait for by a person who doesn't know you well and is part of a system that doesn't treat humans in a real dignified way. So it can sound like, Mike, I gave you a 3.2 out of five. I never give anything higher than a four because I don't want people to feel good. And I'd like some more hustle from you this year, like when you started with us, uh, maybe come up with some goals because I didn't. And uh, I put down that your strengths are consistency, I guess, and your weaknesses are you don't read my mind and you don't w like to wear the swag that we gave you. Like this, um, <laughs> I'm trying to be entertaining about it. Um, and oh yeah, what did you put down for your rating, you know? Um, 
If you're in leadership or HR or thinking of running your own company, please never use these things and instead just be a human and make good enough um, relationships with your employees and be direct with them and know them well enough and invest more in real human leadership, good leadership. The problem that I have with most jobs, especially corporate, is like the difference between what the, what the corporate values are on paper versus how the company behaves and operates with people just like the abusive family. There's a strong correlation there that I'm drawing. Or I think it's strong. Um, here is what issues around this looks like. It's like getting one of these performance reviews and getting those arbitrary weird ratings, especially when you're overworked and not seen. It's really unfair. Having an odd relationship with the boss and they have all the power to tell you what they kind th think what kind of employee you are without really knowing your workload or what you do or who you are. And the, or that the review is just kind of ho-hum and flat and you even now feel even more insignificant at the place. It could be the energy, the energy of the person giving the review is off. Most times the supervisor has their own stuff going on about this stuff and they can range from being really nervous to indifferent to being avoiding or to faking a leadership role with you. So here are some signs that you are triggered by issues around the performance review. Um, really being thrown off by that subjective rating or written evaluation and becoming highly activated about it in many ways. Um, becoming triggered to rage or being shut down or being afraid that you're going to lose your job. And the subjectivity is where our inner child can come up and run us. Um, because I think in another video I said something like ambiguity is a huge trigger for us and that subjectivity, you could just see the inner child going like, well, a 3.2, like that's not even the fence and what, are, you know, like are they just gonna get rid of me and like all that thinking can drive you crazy. Another, you know, could be that you go to a very depressed place like a breakup where because of your trauma we put to way too much stock in our relationship to our job when it comes to our value or comes to our worth. So here is where this trigger might come from in childhood. Um, this can look like having any of the following. Abusive parents that have a twisted view of who their children are. They don't know their children. They only see the role that they put their children in, like the scapegoat or the parent or the kid that's going to grow up and take care of them financially and be all that or whatever. Um, or parents who wanted you to be something that just wasn't you in any way. Um, related to that if you grew up where the feedback was really off, like being compared to others or being held to impossible standards, like you're six and you're criticized for not performing like an adult. Growing up where you were doing your best to get through things, this is a big one, without having any help from healthy adults and then you're criticized about how you're doing. Feedback really gets complicated for trauma survivors. It's common for trauma survivors to get deeply triggered around feelings like they're being kicked when they're down when it comes to feedback, real or imagined. And by that, I mean, due to our childhood trauma, we might feel like we're barely making it emotionally, running in survival mode, worried about how we're being seen at work. And a performance review will just bring all that up. Um, and now that they've found you out and all that kind of stuff, or they've added unfair criticism onto you, um, when you do a fine job of that all by yourself, that kind of a thing. And another is, you know you're triggered by a performance review if you go to a really deep, hopeless place about it, that you're, and you interpret the message like you're, you're never gonna be seen, you're never gonna be valued since they have all the power. Does that feel familiar to you in your child in any way? Um, I strongly advocate for not ever doing performance reviews again, and just like a broken record about that, and just really advocate for healthy mentoring. And lastly, in a funny way about that rating, wouldn't it be wouldn't it be honest and funny if someone was like, Patrick, I think you're a 3.2. And I was like, well, I don't see it that way, but I am now. Um, meaning like <laughs> that a performance review would kind of like shoot themselves in the foot just because it's like, it's just kind of insulting to the employee. Hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. So moving on, coming in at number five, here is what I called, you should be thrilled. This one is rooted in how work environments are not rooted in the reality about employment and that they, can, that they imply that you should be just as pumped for working at Tchotchkes as much as you're pumped about the, your outside life. Um, and for non-US viewers, I'm just making a joke about a fictitious restaurant called Tchotchkes, like a chain restaurant in, in like something in like that movie Office Space. As childhood trauma survivors, we often grow up in parental narcissism 
inauthenticity, excuses, lies, manipulation, and off relationship triangles, like if we're parentified. So when we go to work for a place that pressures employee enthusiasm about the place, or about the product, or about the culture, we can really get triggered to almost disgust, or, or literal disgust. Here's what this looks like. Being consistently, directly or indirectly told that you have a lack of enthusiasm or a bad attitude about the job, real or imagined. Having coworkers who seem to be more jazzed about the place than you are. Um, being excluded or looked down upon for your lack of enthusiasm. On the or the other side of it, where we might fake being into it because of our own shame and not wanting to seem irritable or seem like a bad employee. Another is being down on yourself or confused about not being enthusiastic enough for lack of having your own identity or your own preferences. Like, it's okay to not be into tchotchkes, but you shame, you shame yourself um, for not being as into it as other people are. Um, you, you long for a job that doesn't require all this extra BS, extra energy from you. And here's what the triggers look like. A pattern of trying to get yourself to rally or show some energy, which exhausts you. Being incredibly resentful, if not rebellious or oppositional about that pressure. Being incredibly activated about being asked to, to do extra or to bring extra energy. Experiencing shame around feeling negative. Trying to get other employees to see it your way and connect around the grossness of it all. Um, experiencing some, some rage about the one-sidedness of it or being shamed about not giving that extra energy about the place. And here is where the triggers might come from. Parents who overly celebrated or a more compliant sibling at your expense. Narcissistic parents who thought really highly of themselves. Parents who made you feel indebted to them for bringing you into the world. Growing up in abuse where what you were feeling wasn't safe to express, like sadness or frustration, like it wasn't okay to not be into something or growing up where the only emotions that were acceptable to the toxic parents were pleasantness and compliance and to not need anything. That's what I mean by one-sidedness. Like the trigger around side work, parents who made a really big deal about providing basic things and expecting a lot of loyalty in return, um, the you should be thrilled trigger is really rooted in how abusive families will erase their children's emotions and their individuality uh, by being completely self-serving um, while using shame and manipulation to make you feel bad about having normal feelings about just simply not liking something. So here's how to be less triggered with work. Here are some journaling prompts to figure out what the childhood trauma piece is and direct our energy to that childhood trauma instead of mucking around with our jobs or having them take up too much headspace or emotional space. Here are two journaling prompts to work on these triggers. The first is work with and address the projection. Projecting our family system onto these, these places is what keeps us engaged in these battles. And the same is true for our romantic relationships. What you do is you ask your inner child, how do you want to be seen by your job? And what I mean by that is, what's the fantasy or wish around either something like being valued more or being left alone? Um, do you maybe want your job to make better decisions that you'd suggested? Do you, do you want to be heard? Do you want the place to admit how crappy it is to get some truth out of them? Um, do you want them to see your real value and understand your work difficulty? Do you maybe want them to fail or receive some kind of karma? Could any of these issues that, that are listed or come to mind be applied to your parents from growing up? That's what I mean by projection. Project projection usually isn't cut and dry like the side work thing that I mentioned with my father. You, you really have to reflect and think outside of a concrete black and white thinking kind of box and explore how it's familiar to your family to, in order to draw some correlations to figure it out. For example, a trigger, around, a trigger around not being valued at work can simply come back to just being neglected as a kid or having a really disengaged parent. But what's gonna help you in it is to really come up with some specific ideas or examples about how that was true. Um, like a parent not showing up for your graduation does that remind you of your boss in some way? The work here is about seeing our job for what it is and to check ourselves and our expectations that come from the damage of our childhood trauma. The second journaling prompt is how to make the present better. 
A journaling prompt for this one is how can you, the inner adult, not the inner child, make the relationship with your job smaller and more emotionally manageable to you? For example, every boss I've had, either in a professional job or a restaurant job or restaurant managers, came and went in my life. Before I made any significant progress in therapy, they would trigger the mess out of me and I'd lose sleep. But the reality is, they're just, you know, other bozos on the bus in our life and all those relationships have an expiration date to them. So that can sometimes help making it smaller. Does your inner child need help from you in making that relationship more right-sized? Your boss isn't your spouse or your kids or your family. And at the end of the day, they really don't matter in the grand scheme of your life. In addition, if you are really stuck around employment, you, the adult, can ask the inner child, what do they need from the adult about the job? Do they want the adult to find something different? Do they want the adult to speak up for them around work boundaries? Are they scared about doing something else, like, like I mentioned earlier, something to explore there? Or do they not believe that there is something better in store for them um, and they have to tolerate their job? Take those answers to heart, and I know it's confusing, but does the adult part of you feel confident to speak up or find something better? Some general reflective thoughts. Do you need to withdraw from your job emotionally? to not people please so much, to not look for recognition and just try to do your work and try to not engage so much. And to try to, the best you can, let your resentments go and not let your personal triggers get in the way of making the job right-sized. I know that that's incredibly hard to do, but to look at it like it's just a paycheck and not a battleground for something. Um, do you need to accept the job for what it is, not what your inner child projects, like a place to be heard and to be seen? Um, or a place to be um, vindicated or to be right for once. Um, the best piece of advice in my life was from my mentor, Amanda Curtin, who said to me when I was triggered about a boss at the time, she said, don't sweat people who aren't in your inner circle. And, the and it's funny, but she gave me that wisdom when I was really triggered to an abusive restaurant manager. <laughs> Sorry if you're a restaurant manager, I know that they're not all bad, but um, that got me through so much and I still use it. Don't pay any emotional attention to others when they're not your friends, your chosen family, or your partner. And that's a mental boundary and was super helpful to me. Most of my work is about getting the adult more in place and confident to make scary changes on behalf of the inner child. Um, and it's all about the adult, not just hoping for more strength one day or a better mood one day to do things differently. So I hope this video was helpful to you, if not maybe a little bit entertaining about our work lives. If something really stuck out to you, please make a comment about it, something that really moved you. Or better yet, if you found yourself out of a really bad job situation and you were able to take a risk and find something healthier and happier, I would love to hear about the comments to share about that because people need to hear those stories. And as always, may you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well, may you be peaceful and at ease, may you be joyous, and I will see you next time. Thanks so much.